doing tonight? Good. All right, come on, we're at the American Legion celebrating democracy tonight. We can do a little better than that. How's everybody doing tonight? Outstanding. So I just wanted to welcome everyone and thank you for coming to the American Legion Dalton Post. My name is Paul Anastasio. I'm the senior vice commander here at the Post, as well as a resident of Holbrook. On behalf of the commander, Andy Best, and the rest of the executive board, um, you know, we thank you all for coming. I'd like to share a short story with you, which kind of ties all in with uh, why we decided to, to host an event here. Um, I wish Matthew Nelson, our junior vice commander, was here, but he got called into the firehouse and was unable to make it. But um, he was, while he was deployed in Iraq, he provided security for some of the very first elections that ever took place and uh, with the removal of Saddam Hussein. And they got a couple calls and hints, you know, from Intel stating that there were going to be, you know, sniper fire, IEDs along the board and stuff like that. And this was one of the very first uh, elections in Iraq and, and they just couldn't wrap their head around, you know, democracy and women voting and things like that. So when we had the opportunity to, to host an event like this with a Meet the Candidates, it was very important to us and the executive board and, and the rest of the, the members here, um, you know, where we could have free speech and democracy and stuff like that. So throughout the throughout the route to vote over in Iraq, there were IEDs placed all over the roadside, sniper fire was coming in regularly, insurgents trying to stop citizens from voting. Uh, people still came and vote. The United States Marines continued to fight and defend the positions and uh, um, provide safety for this monumental day in history against the insurgents. There's something Many in our country that take for granted the simple fact that we have free men and women living in a society protected by a blanket of freedom. You can go home tonight, you can go on Instagram, you can go on Facebook, you can post whatever you want within reason and not have to worry about the doors getting kicked down by the military or corrupt police and, and have to worry about that. Because the First Amendment states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the freedom of, of press or the right of the people peacefully to assemble. So tonight, I want to see people get excited. There's a lot of candidates here, you know, that pulled papers, that had the grit to do it, go out and get all those signatures, and, you know, show up and appear today. So when we heard about the town's election, we thought it was only fitting to host a meeting, you know, meet the candidates under our roof. We cannot endorse any one candidate or pol political affiliation, according to Article 2 of our national bylaws, but we can host an event like this in, um, and promote Americanism and democracy. Some people thought it was an odd choice to have it at, you know, the bar or the American Legion, but there's no other venue that was offered to, you know, to host or meet the candidates, so we thought it was only fitting to do that, so. So I wanted to share a couple stories with you guys, you know, from, that you might remember in your history book that, that ties in with this. So on December 4th, 1783, following the end of the Revolutionary War, George Washington abruptly retires his commission and resigns as the commanding general of the Continental Army. He summons his offices to Francis Tavern in New York City and delivers an apparently hot-moving address that includes a long statement about his appreciation for his offices and what they have done over the past decade. It ends with General Washington personally embracing each one of them and saying goodbye. And that happened at a bar. On November 10, 1775, the Continental Congress commissioned Samuel Nicholson, the owner of Philly's Tun Tavern, to raise two battalions of Marines in Philadelphia. The tavern's manager, Robert Mullen, was the chief marine recruiter, and so immediately set up a station in the tavern itself. By all accounts, he quickly filled the roles of American patriots with local recruits looking for adventure and a chance to serve. And as I'm sure everybody in here is familiar, in December 1773, after months of protesting England's tax on tea, New Englanders, New Englanders had had enough. A small group of most of the active patriots met at the Green Dragon Tavern, to plan their message to the king. They eventually answered to storm three vessels sitting in the bay of Boston Harbor. Their act of defiance would go down in history as one of the most iconic symbols of America, resistance to tyranny, and the whole thing was planned at a bar. So let me ask you this, why would he not have this event here at the American Legion? So, there's a few rules I just want to go over tonight. You know, each candidate will have 10 minutes to introduce themselves, explain why they're running, and explain uh, things that they'd like to get done while they're in the office and a little bit about their background. 
No direct questions from the audience. All the all the candidates have have um, it, had said that they would hang around and field any questions afterwards um, individually. Um, I just ask everybody to take a moment, silent your phones, uh, make sure those aren't on, and and just try to remain silent while all the candidates are speaking. We have selected the order of the speakers by random by one of the bartenders that doesn't live at the bar, so there's no partisism or anything like that. Um, the order was Daniel Lee, who was unable to make it tonight. He said he can come out here Monday between 6 and 8 and meet with anybody who's interested in you know, fielding questions. Um, so now it's Kevin Coster up first and followed by Mike Ashner. If you'd like to join me, stand. Uh, join me with the Pledge of Allegiance and remove your hats and place your right hand over your heart. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. So at first I'd like to call up um, Kevin Costa. Thank you. Good evening. I want to thank the Legion for hosting this event. My father served in the Army overseas during the Vietnam War. My sister-in-law also served in the Army overseas during the Iraq War. My brother-in-law, Captain Philip Dow, served in the 11th Armored Cavalry 2nd Regiment, the Black Horse Regiment. On February 17, 2005, he earned a Purple Heart for wounds he suffered to three of his four limbs when a car bomb exploded in Iraq. The injuries left him scarred with plates and screws in his legs and shoulders. The fragments of the car bomb will remain in him for the rest of his life. Being the American hero he is, he returned to Iraq for another deployment as soon as he recovered. He was awarded two bronze stars during his deployments. My family understands the sacrifice a soldier's family makes to defend the country. And I thank you and your families for their sacrifice to ensure our country remains free and allow democracy to live. I want to thank my fellow candidate for attending as well as those voters who were able to come out on short notice and listen and meet all the candidates. I want to thank HCAM for recording this so that residents will be able to view it at their leisure that weren't able to attend. My name is Kevin Costa and I'm a candidate for the Board of Selectmen. I ask for your vote on Tuesday, April 5th. I grew up in South Boston as one of nine children. My wife Marie and I purchased our home in Holbrook in 2003. We have three wonderful children, Samantha who's 10 and attends uh, fourth grade at the South Michaela, who's seven, in his first grade at the JFK, and my son Nathan, who is uh, five and starting uh, kindergarten in the fall. My wife and I have coached Tesa in the Little League, and we are parishioners at St. Joe's. I am the inventory control manager and buyer at National Lumber in Mansfield, Massachusetts, for the past 14 years. When I was 13, I was diagnosed with leukemia and underwent treatment for chemo and radiation for two years. That experience helped to shape me greatly. I have known far too many friends and kids who did not win their battle. I often wonder why them and not me. But I have taken a lesson I was told and tried to live it every day. Those with an ability have a responsibility to give back. This is something I try to do in every aspect of my life, give back. I started giving back shortly after completing treatments when I was 16 by volunteering at Camp Carroll, a summer camp for children with cancer something I had the pleasure of doing for 10 years until the camp closed. While at Camp Cal, I met some incredible people, including two wonderful, wonderful families from Holbrook, who also had children that attended the camp. I started giving back in public life when I was awarded a fellowship and then Governor Weld's Office of Constituent Services. Shortly after moving to Holbrook in 2003, I started giving back and became involved in town government by becoming a town meeting member. In 2006, I was appointed as a member of the Holbrook Finance Committee. In 2008, I was honored for the membership of that committee elected me to serve as their chairman, a position I still hold today. I have also served as chairman of the Town Government Study Committee for several years. I have attended well over 400 meetings as a member of these committees in Holbrook, and I have missed less than 10 scheduled meetings. I have shown over a decade that I am committed to giving back in the town of Holbrook. You may be thinking, he seems like an okay guy, at least I, hopefully you're thinking that. But why should I elect Kevin Costa to the Board of Selectmen on Tuesday, April 5th? I believe that my financial knowledge, experience, and analytical skills will help complement greatly the existing Board of Selectmen. I know all the players and opportunities. 
I can start right away at impacting change. I have proven over a decade that I can work with all stakeholders during good times and difficult times to ensure all are heard before making a decision. When I began on the Holbrook Finance Committee, Holbrook had negative cash flow and our rainy day fund was less than 5% of our budget. During my first three years, we endured multiple state aid cuts, but we managed. And now we have positive free cash for the last six years. Our rainy day accounts are now over 5% of our budgets and we have begun to invest in our capital again. We got through this process by establishing policies and procedures for our town, but also holding departments and ourselves accountable to those policies. We have been able to present town meeting 10 balanced budgets that collectively have left over $800,000 of taxes unassessed, ensuring a balance between the taxpayer and the needs of the town. We have accomplished great things on the Finance Committee, but too often our hands have been tied because the most significant decisions are made in the negotiating table, the decisions that affect the budget, taxes, and service levels. I am the only non-Holbrook employee running. I am the only candidate that can enter every negotiation without a conflict of interest, real or perceived. I will bring my fresh perspective to all negotiations and discussions. You can know that when I am at the table, we will get the best possible deal for Holbrook, and it will always be the right deal. In the private sector, I negotiate deals with billion dollar companies. I know what makes a good deal and what doesn't make a good deal. I know far too many deals have been made that are not right for Holbrook's long-term future. I will ensure that Holbrook's taxpayers are the front of every negotiation. Holbrook taxpayers always come first with me. I will be available to work hard to improve the quality of life of all Holbrook residents, whether it's working with police to get illegal activity off our streets, working with religious organizations and Holbrook Cares to deal with the opioid epidemic, or working with commercial industrial partners to ensure they follow previously established rules and regulations. I am the only candidate that has attended the regular meetings of the Economic Development Committee. I am the person who can help bring positive economic growth to Holbrook. And I believe that my fresh perspective will help the town to work with developers and businesses to come here, stay here, and thrive in Holbrook. I will work with our planning and planning board to review and update our zoning. Our zoning today is too restrictive in places. Do you know that our most restrictive zoning is two to three times greater than all of our neighbors' most restrictive zoning? This needs to change. We need to allow for more construction to be done in Holbrook as of right. And I will work with our boards and town meeting to make that happen. There are those that think that more housing and families will cost more money than it generates. That's false. A five to 10% increase in population will not impact our overhead at all. Your fixed costs remain the same. Administrative personnel, street lights, snow budget, debt payments, those don't change. Your marginal costs may change, but the revenues and benefits far exceed any marginal costs. Growth is good for Holbrook. Growth is needed for Holbrook. Holbrook and Avon are the only towns on the South Shore that are not, part, that are mar not marked by the state as economic target areas. That's right. The ETA is where businesses look to see where opportunities exist. Braintree, Randolph, Weymouth, Abington, and Brockton are all designated. Why aren't we? I will make that change so Holbrook is on the map for every potential business. At a meeting I attended a few weeks back, a developer made a statement that this region is like a donut and that Holbrook is like the center of that donut, meaning void and nothing really there. We are surrounded by towns with direct access to highways, so they may have greater potential for certain commercial development. But I want you to take a minute, picture a donut. Now, not that plain donut he was talking about. Picture a Boston cream donut. On the surface of that donut, you have that chocolate frosting. It's hard to see what's happening inside, and I really like Boston cream donuts, so that <laughs> I like them. Um, you know when you bite into that donut, and sometimes you just get a whole lot of donut and none of that cream? It's okay, but that's not really what you want. What you want when you get to that center of the donut, that's where it all comes together. And that's what makes all the parts come to life. I love that our town is the center of that donut and the hub of this region. I will work with, other, with others to change their perspective on what Holbrook is and isn't. And no longer view Holbrook as just a hole in the center of a region, but rather the wonderful center where all the good stuff comes together. In closing, I want to leave you with this. I did not grow up in Holbrook. 
I did not go to school here in Holbrook, but I am passionate about Holbrook. I live here, I raise, I raise my family here, I volunteer here, and I am committed to ensuring Holbrook grows and thrives for many more generations. I ask you to please allow me to bring my fresh perspective to the Holbrook Board of Selectmen by voting for me, Kevin Costa, on Tuesday, April 5th. Thank you, and God bless America. All right, thank you, Kevin. Next up, I'd like to call Michael Eshner. Good evening, and thank you for having me. I would first like to take the time to thank Paul and the Legion for hosting this event, as well as Kevin for coming down here tonight. It's great to see a local business help bridge the gap between candidates and voters. Unfortunately, in society these days, fewer people take the time to educate themselves on the issues and the candidates who are seeking election. I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight after putting in a full day's work to do both. The other night, after hearing about this great opportunity to talk to people, I sat down and started to rack my brain on what I wanted to say. I knew this would be an invaluable platform to talk to the public and did not want to miss my mark. So I began to go down the list of the standard things to put in this speech. I would need to explain to all that my wife and I are lifetime residents of this town with two great kids. Try to impress upon you how active we are in the community. I could convey how I want to be a champion of business to grow our tax base. Explain how I want to give residents a much needed tax break. I could hammer that point until I was blue in the face so there was no misunderstanding of what I stood for. It is obviously a huge issue in town and the foundation for my campaign. Of course, I would be remiss if I did not explain my achievements as they are generally the basis for being taken seriously while simultaneously giving great insight as to who the person speaking truly is. How I am a decorated combat veteran with multiple tours of duty. How as a town police officer I've been recognized by the chief of police and board of selectmen for actions while on duty in de-escalating a potentially deadly situation bringing a peaceful resolution. Most importantly, that through all the challenges I've faced in my life, I did not just succeed but I excelled. I am a natural leader with the ability to think critically and objectively while possessing the integrity and character to fight for the best interests of the greater good. Now, I was not a politician prior to this endeavor, but since I began this undertaking, I have come to see the basic formula. Talk about personal life, achievements, and goals if elected. But for some reason, given the venue and audience, I felt you deserved more from me than a cookie cutter political speech. That a speech such as that would be unfitting of a place dedicated to veterans and honoring fellow brothers in arms. This sent me into even deeper thought. What haven't I said to the people? What more could I give them? So I took inventory of what I've told the public, and it didn't take long before I realized I have answered all the questions except for one. Why? Now I'm not talking about the why that's answered because we need business or tax relief or paved roads. Not the why that is answered with my resume or because I have character and integrity. I mean the true, uncut, raw reason why. This sent me into deep thought because the answer had to come from within. I sat there for quite some time and my mind wandered, sauntering through so many, many memories from my past. Playing with, with my brothers as a kid, high school bull, bulldog football, into the feeling of holding my daughter for the first time. And then I began to recall my experiences overseas, namely Iraq. As any veteran will tell you, we are sent to some of the most difficult areas of the world, to the dark forgotten corners, places that understand what it's like to not have water when we here in America are mad because our ice maker broke, places where people know what it's like to go hungry, well, we in America pass a dozen different restaurants to get to the one that we finally ordered from, places where kids play in trash dumps because that's the village common, where we in America regulate what wood chips we use so our kids don't get splinters. I'm talking about places in the world where oppression governs and fear reigns. Places like that gave me a profound respect for what our flag means to the world. It can be summed up in one word, hope. This one word might be one of the most powerful emotions humans have the capacity for. 
as any struggle can be endured in hardship weathered if there is hope. Immense sacrifices are made with the hope that they will not be in vain. Our flag acts as a beacon of light that allows those who are embedded in the dark recesses of the world to dream of what could be and endure what they must. Without that experience, I would never have been able to truly see what America's impact on the world is. It cannot be seen through a TV screen or a phone. It needs to be felt. But we over here take so much for granted that sometimes we lose how tenuous our situation is. What we have here sits on a razor-thin edge, yet we have sat there for so long we forget how delicate a society like ours truly is. The fabric is unfolding, and this can be seen by the fact that people can no longer speak their opinion without fear of persecution from the masses. This flies in the face of our American values. Our society is predicated on the fact that I may disagree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. It can further be seen in the lack of participation in this country. No longer is it about we, it's about me, and the 99% consistently cater to the one. No longer is it about the greater good. I always think of my grandparents' generation, what American historians have dubbed our greatest generation. I often joke with my wife that I should have been born in 1920 because I identify with the values and beliefs of that generation. I identify with the work ethic and sacrifice for the greater good that they were known for. This is a generation that did not look for praise in stepping up for the cause because to them it was their duty. It was incumbent upon them because that is the price we are asked to pay for living in this country. Active citizenship is the marrow of our nation and it pains me to see how far we've strayed from that. That is why I'm running for office. I no longer wish to stand idly by when I can raise my hand and attempt to make a difference. No longer can I stand to complain about the problem while not volunteering to be a part of the solution. My burning sense of duty supersedes any apprehensions that I may have. The amount of droplets needed to fill the American pond are incalculable, and I feel it is my obligation to at least attempt to add to that basin. Now maybe the stance I take and the person I am inspires someone to join me in this endeavor and promote not only my ideas for this community, but the ideals I hope to represent. I pray that I will be granted the honor and privilege of serving this community. However, come April 5th, whether I get one vote or a thousand, it'll be a win. Because at the end of the day, my children were able to watch their father take a stand. They will witness firsthand what duty and service to others looks like, and that sense of duty and country will be instilled in them. Hopefully those principles will be passed down through generations of my family, and I will be the root cause of the pendulum, swinging ever so gently in the opposite direction the same direction that allows our flag to shower the world with hope. I thank you for your time. God bless you all, and God bless these United States of America. All right, everybody, again, I thank everybody for coming tonight, and I appreciate the two candidates that could make it. And, um, you know, let's keep in mind, spread the word, and let's everybody get out and vote on Election Day. Thank you very much. Twenty-six people, including six adults and twenty-six and seven-year-old students, were shot and killed as class was in session inside the school. Two pressure cooker bombs went off near the finish line of the 117th Boston Marathon, wounding more than... A gunman opened fire with a semi-automatic weapon at Fort Hood in Texas, killing three people and... Militant group Boko Haram abducted 276 girls between the ages of 16... Two suspects opened fire in San Bernardino, California at a holiday party in Inland Regional Center. The attack killed 14 children of Paris. Smile, show your teeth, and love life. That is the best attack you can have on a terrorist group. When people see you, they should see hope. 
not tragedy. We have partnered with the Generation on the Martin Richard Foundation to show the world that in response to this endless tra tragedy, we must be peaceful and kind. We have great hope that we can spread the message of peace and tolerance, which will act as an inspiration to the Holbrook community and beyond. We take our inspiration from children who, like Martin Richard, were caught in the fallout of hate, conflict, and violence. Bulldogs are building bridges in Holbrook and beyond. Please join us to help achieve Martin's dream. No!